let's look at how you write some actual code in the Julia environment. You can in Julia do exactly like in Python or Ruby and just start with writing individual files that you're running kind of like scripts. But the Julia way is really to always be writing code. Well, that's not entirely true. I do in fact write some simple scripts. I often start off with that. But you don't have to go very far before you actually want to be writing packages. In Julia, everything is about packages. You write your code in packages and those packages depend on other packages. For a larger system, you might be writing multiple packages that have various dependencies between them. And the reason why you want to focus on packages is because they give you a lot of advantages that we'll be uh, looking at. So the first thing that you typically want to do before you get started is to use a package called revise. Now, if you don't have this already installed, you can go into package mode and then you can do add revise like that and it will go through the registry and, and try to look that up. Now, I already have that, so that's uh, not a problem. So once you have the package, you can write using revise, which would load the package. And this is very useful to know about because revise makes Julia development so much better than it would be just out of the package. If you just use what comes with the standard library, because revise monitors changes that you make to your module so that they're reflected immediately in in the REPL environment. Now we're going to show you exactly what I mean by that. So let's go into uh, package mode and create a Julia package. If you start using Julia for the first time, you might not know exactly how you do it. You could start looking here and we can see here, well, generate, generate files for a new project. That's the one we should be using. So we can do a question mark generate and it says, well, you write generate and then a package name. So let's do that generate and what I'm going to be showing you is parsing some Roman numerals. So stuff like like this, I want to parse those and turn those into integer numbers. So I'm going to call the package Roman numerals using plurals is a very common uh, thing to do when naming Julia packages. So you can see that it tells us what it generated. It created a new directory called Roman numerals and inside it, we put a project.toml and there's a source directory that contains our Julia source code files, all the Julia source code files and with .jl and we have one called Roman numerals. Now we can go into this package. I use the shell mode and I launch my preferred the text editor, which is text mate. And I can call that with this mate. I just use a, a dot for the current directory. So this gives us text mate. Let me make that a little bit bigger. So we have the project Tamil gives us the name of the project, the current version we have, who is making it and this unique identifier. And the reason that exists is because somebody else somewhere else in the world might be making a package name exactly the same. So in that case, you want to make sure that you're not mixing those up. So just to give you an impression of what exactly we mean by this, if we're trying to do add, so we're adding a package, then you can see there are some examples of here of adding. So normally you would just do like this, right? But maybe there are multiple packages that are called examples. So in that case, you can do add an example equals, and then we're using the, this, the UUID, the universal unique identifier, this one. So this is a great way of making it possible to avoid name collisions. Okay, it just creates a very basic module. So a module is basically a namespace for our package. Uh, now we don't wanna use this simple function here. We're going to create a function called parse Roman, parse Roman, and it's gonna take a text string. And this parses Roman numeral to integer. 
So what I'm, I was just do, using here is uh, what we call snippets in um, TextMate. So you have these various snippets. I could do FX for a, a function. If I want a documentation, I can write the doc and then I can start writing some documentation for that. Uh, arguments, some description of that and so on. I'm not gonna write an extra new function now. So let's just add that as the argument that you want here. So we're gonna just start off by just returning 10 every time. And I'm gonna export parse Roman. And what that does is it just brings parse Roman into the current namespace. If I'm using it, I wouldn't have to write the Roman numerals dots parse Roman each time. I can just, just use the parse Roman here. Now we can um, use Roman numerals now you might have noticed I'm not actually adding Roman numerals. And the reason is I've actually set up my system so that it looks in particular directories for packages. So in, in this particular subdirectory, it will look in this one for packages that I made. So it's a very just handy way of doing it if you're doing developments. Using Roman numerals, I can call it. You see, I get completion. We can try it out. You see, it doesn't really work at the moment. Helps us to know that it works. Uh, let's just put that one back. So you can see that it's very easy to add help. So what's very nice about this is if you write a large project and you're with you know thousands of functions, you can easily look up the documentation for that with this system. So you know, remind yourself what the functions you wrote yourself are and of course if you don't know you know what are the functions i have you can write roman numerals and hit uh tab and you can see which that's complete to of course i only have one function there at the moment anyway we need to change this one so i'm cheating a little bit i'm getting some code from somewhere else and pasting this in and here's the neat thing, the magic that Revise gives us. If I do parse Roman now, well, it's not actually gonna work right away, but you can see that it has changed. So right now, Julia is doing a recompilation and I wanted on purpose to introduce a mistake here. So it says this Roman numerals that you can actually find here that has no clue what that is. Now we can look through this description here to, to find a description of where this error is. And you can see that it's on line eight in the Roman numerals file. And this is where using iterm2 is really helpful. And you should see if you can find some kind of similar text terminal for yourself. I can just hold down command and I can just click on it and I jump straight into my file. If I close this one now and I do that, it will get open. So that is very handy. Let's make that a little bit bigger again. Let's go back to what we were doing. This was on the eighth line. We're lacking this one. Again, I'm gonna be cheating a little bit and I have this already defined. So this is a dictionary that maps the different Roman numerals to integer. So we have the V mapped to the five, for instance. And we can try this again and see if, if that helps. Again, we have a little, uh, problem and we can just click on it and it shows me that on line 12, I have the zero. So now when you parse it, it works. And so you see it immediately picks up the changes that I made. I don't have to restart Julia or anything like that. Typically when you're working with Julia, you don't wanna be going in and out and in and out of the REPL, which you might be doing with other environments. You're staying in there for a long time. Now, Revise isn't gonna be able to catch every kind of change that you do, particularly if you're changing a type. So there are some cases you would have to go out. Now, when you're working with this file, you might want to jump to a particular function that you're editing. Imagine you have thousands of functions and you wanna be able to get to that. And you might have support for that in your, in your editor. I, I can jump here, for instance, but if you're working with a simple editor, it's actually possible to do that from here. So I can write edit and I can do completion on this edit and then parse Roman. So obviously in the in normal case, I would maybe have a just 
been running this and I, I want to I want to go to it so I do a control a jump to the beginning start writing edit uh, hit enter and it will jump to this definition the really cool thing is this isn't limited to just the code that you're writing you can use this for the Julia source code itself for the the actual standard library and almost everything in Julia is actually written in Julia code and that's very different for for someone that's coming from a Python or a Ruby background where a lot of the core functionality is actually written in C or C++ code and isn't really available to you for easy reading unless you of course know those languages but we can look at an expression like 2 plus I don't know 3.5 and you wonder well how's that implemented in Julia well you can actually find that out so here we jump to that definition we can have uh, let's let's look at uh, we had a print line how does that look was that defined so here we jumped into that and we can see that this print line is actually implemented as a print line that takes a standard out as the first one so it's actually an io object that tells you where are you writing the text to so let's let's try that out it's an alternative so all right standard out and now you can see what that looks like so this is a very useful <clears throat> tool to be able to jump into pretty much anywhere in the Julia standard library and see how things are implemented. And I use that a lot to actually learn how things work and get tips on, you know, how are they actually the Julia creators writing their code? Maybe I can pick up some good ideas from them. Now say that you want to do some kind of simple debugging. So you have some problem here. What's nice is that I don't have to restart this or I could have just added some kind of print line in here, of course, and then I can easily remove that later. You know, if you're using Git, you can just revert. Or you could put in a, a debug. So at debug, and I'm going to show the X value. So when you have this uh, symbol here in the beginning, I see I'm using a lot. These are macros, and these are evaluated before things get compiled. If it's not needed, if it's not toggled, if debug hasn't been toggled on, this is not actually going to get included in the code. So there's no overhead in adding this here. So if I if I go uh, back here and and try to uh, parse Roman, let's see, you can see it doesn't actually write out anything. Uh, so we have to toggle on a debug mode. So this is a point of actually using debug. If I, if I wrote something like say warn, that would uh, always show up. It's not. I might not really want that. You know, for debug, I just wanted in a few cases to actually write that out. So how do we toggle that on? And I actually forget all the time how you do that. Fortunately, I remember that it has to do with an environment and variable. In my REPL history, I have written some environment variables. I just write ENV, which is where we have the environment variables, and hit a tab. And I just cycle through and like, oh yeah, that's that's how I, I toggle a lot on. And I hit enter. And now we can see that you get a debug for that. And of course, if I want to toggle that off, I do like that and now you can see that it doesn't show it so we have a bunch of different things here depending on what your logging mode is I can do info for instance so that's uh, that's always going to show as well and it's pretty smart I think I could I can put in an expression like that let's see how that works <clears throat> 